Welcome everybody, Happy New Year. It's uh, January 13th and um, we continue our series on brain and spine health. And today I'm, I'm fortunate and privileged to be joined by Dr. Zonenschein, who is one of our star neurosurgeons here at Brooklyn Methodist and part of our Department of Cornell uh, Neurologic Surgery. Um, today he's gonna be talking about a bit of a grab bag of topics, movement disorders, things like Parkinson's disease, tremor, but then also things uh, that we deal with in neurosurgery that are really quite interesting related to peripheral nerve disorders. You've heard of carpal tunnel, I'm sure, uh, but there's so much more to that, which he's gonna discuss as well. So thank you all for joining. And again, happy new year. I'd be remiss, uh, Marty, if you could show the next slide uh, to not just show our team here at Brooklyn Methodist, um, which is ever expanding. Uh, we're really excited. We're uh, Cornell Department of Neurosurgery here now in Brooklyn and uh, really have stellar docs across all aspects of neurosurgery, whether it's movement disorders, uh, brain surgery, spine surgery, um, et cetera. Um, so if you, uh, if you have the need, please let us know. We're happy to see you uh, in, in any of our office locations here in Brooklyn. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Zonenschein, who again is one of our uh, exemplar neurosurgeons, um, who's going to be talking about movement disorders and peripheral neurosurgery. So Marty, thank you very much. Thank you so very much, uh, Rohan, and thank you to all the attendees for taking the time out and uh, uh, coming to review some of these interesting topics. It's a privilege to be speaking with you. Um, and while at first these topics seem to be very, very different, peripheral nerve surgery and functional neurosurgery, uh, the primary goal, in fact, of this lecture series and of this uh, uh, lecture in particular is, of course, to improve the people's quality of life. And, and these two topics are extremely salient in that regard. And so the first portion of my talk is going to be uh, focused on uh, peripheral nerve surgery, but in the interest of time, I'll probably go through that a little bit quicker than the second aspect of my talk, which is uh, uh, focused on the surgical treatment of uh, movement disorders and in particular, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. So I'd like to start first with a little bit of brief history and background. Um, the hospital where we currently practice at, a New York Presbyterian Brooklyn Methodist Hospital was founded um, over 130 years ago. It's a 650 bed tertiary care hospital. And in 1993, we joined the NYP regional health network, hospital network. And about four years ago, we formally became part of that NYP uh, network. I've been here, no, not since 1887, but uh, only since 2002. So my practice uh, encompasses a wide spectrum of, of uh, neurosurgical disorders. A uh, little more than half of uh, what I do, in fact, involves uh, various spinal conditions from degenerative conditions. Uh, and I do minimally invasive surgery for various uh, uh, conditions such as lumbar decompression, the microdiscectomy, uh, minimally invasive fusion, kyphoplasty, uh, and of course, the least invasive method of all, which is the non-operative method. Um, we also do a wide spectrum of tumor surgery as it relates to the spine, both metastatic and primary, as well as uh, intradural surgery, uh, and some congenital spine surgery, such as Chiari malformation. And then about a third of my practice involves cranial conditions, uh, and that varies from primary metastatic tumors to hydrocephalus, to intracranial hemorrhage. Um, I also uh, perform treatment for the surgical management of trigeminal neuralgia for patients that have failed non-operative management. Um, and finally, I'll be spending a good portion of the latter half of my talk discussing deep brain stimulation for various conditions, but primarily essential tremor and Parkinson's disease. And then a smaller portion of my current practice involves peripheral nerve surgery. So things that are very common like carpal tunnel release or an ulnar nerve decompression, but things that are less common, things like a perineal nerve decompression or a peripheral nerve tumor that I'll show you examples of, uh, or even peripheral nerve trauma. Um, and obviously the bread and butter muscle and nerve biopsies that uh, neurologists may, may request. So with regards to peripheral nerve, I'll give you a brief outline of what I'm gonna be speaking about. Uh, first, I'm just gonna go through some of the anatomy and some of the common entrapment syndromes uh, that we see in both the upper and lower extremities. And then I'm gonna to touch upon various nerve injuries, the timing thereof, uh, the surgical prognosis. I'll give you some examples of that. And finally, a brief review of some of the peripheral nerve tumors that we as neurosurgeons commonly treat. So to start with, this is a netter slide, of course, of the brachial plexus. 
Um, and as many of you know, the brachial plexus consists of uh, five nerves that are exiting from the lower cervical and upper thoracic spine from C5 to T1. Um, and then those then go into and form three trunks, finally into the visions and then three cords, and then eventually out into the terminal branches of the brachial plexus, which are five nerves, three of which go down all the way down into the hand. And those are the radial, the median, and the ulnar nerves. So I'll briefly go through the primary nerves that, that get compressed in the upper extremity um, from various conditions. And just a brief review, and this is a review that I give to the resident uh, house staff annually. Um, and so I'm gonna go through this rather quickly uh, just to give you a sampling of some of the places where various nerves in the upper extremities uh, can get compressed. So when it comes to median nerve, which is the largest uh, and, 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 and best innervated, so to speak, nerve uh, in the upper extremity, uh, the first place from proximal to distal where it can get compressed is in Struthers ligament. I underline ligament because you'll see uh, the arcade of Struthers being mentioned a little bit later in one or two slides from now for a different nerve. So it can get compressed by Struthers ligament, which is uh, about two to three inches above the medial aspect of the elbow. It can then get compressed between the two heads of the pronator teres, and patients can develop vague aching and uh, pain and, and tingling. Um, and typically it's there all the time. It's not worse uh, at night, which is obviously very different than carpal tunnel syndrome, which very classically will be worse at night. And there's pain in the palm for anatomic reasons that I'm going to touch upon uh, in a few slides. And then the nerve continues on down um, and can get compressed to the anterior interosseous um, nerve, which is a purely motor nerve. So there's no sensory findings with this nerve, it's just weakness. And finally, the most common uh, compression syndrome of a peripheral nerve in the body would be carpal tunnel syndrome, which I'm gonna briefly touch upon here. So this is a cadaveric um, uh, dissection and you can see the left is proximal, the hand is down to the right more distal, and you see the nerve as it's going into the palm of the hand. Uh, what you don't see is that there's a uh, carpal uh, ligament or the transverse carpal ligament that's coming across and acts as the roof of this tunnel. Uh, and so the classic symptoms are gonna be numbness and tingling of the fingers, primarily the first three digits of the hand. Um, it's typically uh, going to also involve pain. That pain can radiate, in fact, uh, very often higher up into the forearm. Um, and it, the symptoms are typically going to be worse at night. The patient may have a positive Tinel sign, which is essentially um, tingling when one goes ahead and compresses or taps on the already compressed nerve. Um, and that can be used for diagnostic purposes. Um, and the etiology of carpal tunnel syndrome is very varied. About half the time, we really don't know what causes it. The other half the time, it's caused by things like endocrinopathy, the most common, especially in Brooklyn, being diabetes. But it can be caused by repetitive motion, um, you know, people that type constantly or jackhammer operators, um, or even pregnant women where the swelling in an already anatomically tight uh, tunnel where the median nerve runs through. The median nerve supplies four muscles in the actual hand. Um, and the acronym for, for, for that, just so that I remember, is LOAF. And those are the first two lumbricals, the opponent's pollicis, uh, the abductor pollicis brevis, and the flexor pollicis brevis. And those are going to be uh, some of the uh, muscles that we're going to test clinically uh, in determining and confirming that uh, the patient's problem indeed is carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and obviously, an EMG or nerve conduction study uh, is, is part of the, the armamentarium that we use. Uh, when we ask the neurologist to confirm what we suspect is the clinical diagnosis. Um, and the treatment for um, this problem after non-operative management fails in the form of, say, splinting and so on, if that fails um, and the patient's symptoms are, are significant and bothersome, we're then going to go ahead and decompress the nerve. And the dissection that you see here, obviously, is far greater than what we typically will do uh, in terms of surgery. Uh, because the incision that we typically make is much, much, much smaller in order to decompress the nerve. Switching gears to the ulnar nerve, uh, the next most common compression syndrome I'll get to in just a moment, but again, going from proximal to distal, the nerve can get compressed by the arcade of Struthers um, and can then get compressed as it comes 
is around the medial aspect of the elbow, the medial epicondyle. Uh, and that's in fact the most common location with the ulnar nerve would be compressed. And in fact is the second most common peripheral nerve entrapment syndrome is ulnar neuropathy. Uh, that's not to be confused with tenderness of pain in the lateral aspect if you're an avid tennis player. That's a very different problem. Uh, and then finally, the nerve can rarely get compressed in Guillain's canal, uh, which is down at the wrist at the level of the transverse carpal ligament. Uh, and in fact, just, just uh, medial to where the median nerve is, is going to be where the ulnar nerve can get compressed uh, at Guillain's canal. In fact, the nerve happens to be above the transverse carpal ligament, unlike with the median nerve, which is running in the tunnel directly underneath. But nevertheless, the nerve can get compressed at that level. Um, and the way to try to determine that uh, is the problem versus the elbow, the cubital tunnel syndrome, is that there's no sensory loss in the dorsum of the hand, primarily because the sensory nerve that goes to the dorsum of the hand um, by the ring and uh, uh, by the fourth and fifth digit um, exits before the level of the wrist. Going on, moving on to the radial nerve, um, axillary compression. So compression of the nerve up in the axilla, so patients that uh, need to use crutches can start to develop a radial nerve problem from chronic compression at that level. Um, moving on down, for, again, from proximal down to distal. Mid-arm compression from things like uh, a humeral fracture up in, uh, in the arm, um, and that can result in wrist and finger drop. But because the nerves, the radial nerve has given off its fibers to the triceps muscle, another uh, nerve, uh, another muscle that's innervated by the radial nerve, um, that, that triceps is working fine. Moving on down, we get to supinator syndrome. Um, and then eventually the radial nerve splits off into two nerves down distally in the hand. Um, one is a purely motor nerve, the posterior interosseous nerve, uh, and the other is superficial radial nerve, which is purely sensory nerve. So, here I'm going to focus first on the sensory side of the hand, just to refresh uh, the anatomy of uh, many people uh, in, in the audience that you already know. And that is the median nerve supplies much of the sensory function on the palmar aspect of the hand, uh, primarily the first three and a half digits of the hand. There's a little bit of radial nerve function um, at the base of the thumb primarily. However, the radial nerve also um, is what innervates the, the dorsal aspect of the hand. Um, the only thing that the ulnar nerve is doing is essentially controlling uh, the sensation to the fifth digit and half of the fourth digit, but on both sides uh, of, of the hand. Now, the thumb, interestingly, one can use the thumb to test the median radial or ulnar neuropathies just with a thumb, at least from a motor standpoint. And the way to do that, and maybe I can demonstrate I'm sorry, it's not going to be terribly visible, but the median nerve, for example, uh, will control, here we go, abduction, abduction of the thumb. So this motion moving out of the plane of the hand uh, is innervated by the median nerve. The radial nerve will do the following. So um, extension of the thumb. And finally, the ulnar nerve is abduction. So if I take uh, a piece of paper and I put it between my thumb and my index finger, try to pull it away, what's preventing that from happening is my thumb squeezing up against my, my second digit, uh, and that's innervated by the ulnar nerve. So with one thumb, we can uh, test the motor function, in fact, of uh, three of the nerves that come down to, to the hand. So moving on now to the lower extremities, um, several uh, relatively common conditions, but not as common as in the upper extremities, one being neuralgia parasthetica, which is essentially the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve coming around the anterior superior iliac spine, which is on the front of the pelvis. And as it comes around, especially in people that are overweight, especially in people that are wearing tight fitting clothing, uh, that can result in impingement of the nerve and result in numbness and pain and, and tingling in the lateral aspect, the outer aspect of uh, the thigh. Um, the next most common is going to be the common perineal nerve of the fibular head. And I'm gonna discuss that on the next slide. That happens to be the most common uh, entrapment syndrome in the lower extremity. And then finally, the tarsal tunnel, um, which is the tibial nerve running down into the ankle and foot and it can get compressed at the level of the uh, medial malleolus, so the medial aspect of the, of the ankle. So uh, perineal nerve is an interesting nerve because um, it has two major branches. So I'm gonna have you pay attention to uh, 
my pointer right here. So the sciatic nerve comes down the back of the leg, splits off into the tibial nerve and the perineal nerve, the common perineal nerve, somewhere several inches above the level of the, of the uh, um, popliteal fossa. And as the nerve is coming down, it then splits, comes around the fibular head, um, and then splits off into the deep and the perineal nerve. And the reason that's important is because whenever there's a nerve problem, the first order of business is to try to isolate and localize where the problem may be, because as a surgeon, uh, that's the information we need in order to get to, to the right spot. Now, very often, our neurology colleagues are extremely helpful, in fact, instrumental um, in helping us in that regard with the nerve test and with the, uh, and with the uh, nerve conduction study. Um, but very often, just a clinical examination is often enough to give us an extremely good idea as to where the problem is. So for example, the deep perineal nerve, uh, which is responsible from a motor standpoint to be able to dorsiflex your ankle. And so a significant problem with a deep perineal nerve will result in a drop foot, but that only innervates a very small portion of the dorsum of the foot, okay? Whereas the superficial perineal nerve primarily is a sensory nerve. And so it's going to innervate the sensation to much of the uh, front of the shin and the dorsum of the foot. Uh, and it has a more minor motor component, which is foot eversion. Okay? So if we go ahead and we examine someone with a drop foot and they happen to have numbness throughout the entire dorsum of the foot, uh, including the first web space, that means we know that the problem is higher than the superficial and the deep perineal nerve, um, and probably at the level of the common perineal nerve. Again, assuming the drop foot is coming from a, uh, from a perineal nerve problem. Now, in terms of a foot drop, lots of different causes, and, and you're going to see this uh, for the physicians in the audience, you're going to see this from time to time, um, and you know, you're going to assume it's always a lumbar spine problem, like I sometimes do, but that assumption is incorrect. In fact, there are lots of various causes for foot drop, and I'm gonna start from distal to more proximal, and the most uh, distal problem could be a neuromuscular disorder. Um, and as we travel up the leg, it can be a perineal neuropathy, like we just described. Uh, there could be a sciatic nerve problem, either a trauma or iatrogenic, a needle uh, that gets uh, placed uh, in that vicinity can cause injury to sciatic nerve. And as we go up higher into the pelvis, it could be the lumbosacral plexus. Uh, probably one of the most common causes for foot drop is, of course, an L4 and L5 radiculopathy. So a lumbar disc herniation, for example, is quite common. Um, and then eventually we can get into the spinal cord, and that in and of itself can also cause a foot drop. Uh, examples include polio or, or uh, rare spinal tumors. Um, but things that commonly get overlooked include uh, brain tumors or a stroke. So for example, a false seam meningioma, if it's overlying the motor cortex, it's exactly where the motor area for um, the foot is, for the leg is, in terms of the motor homunculus, and that can cause a foot drop. And other uh, more rare causes, such as charcot marie tooth, hereditary causes, uh, that can cause a foot drop as well. So I'm gonna switch gears yet again. There's gonna be a lot of that uh, you know, throughout the uh, remaining uh, 45 or so minutes. Uh, and now I'm going to speak a little bit about peripheral nerve injury, and there are various classifications uh, to peripheral nerve injury. Um, the Seddon classification and the Sunderland classification, they're primarily based on what is wrong with the nerve. So if we take a look at this little diagram uh, here on the bottom left, each axon has an endoneurium that wraps around. Um, and then the nerve fascicle has a perineurium, which is a sheath that's going around. And then eventually you get out to the epineurium, which is the fascia that invests the entire nerve. And so depending on which one of those is injured, uh, that's uh, going to uh, tell us what the prognosis is and perhaps what the potential treatment is. And this is a slide, I'm sorry, the text is a bit small, um, but this is essentially what this slide depicts. So for example, a, a uh, um, Sunderland classification uh, uh, class four injury where there's disruption of not only the axon, but the endoneurium as well as the perineurium, even though the epineurium over the whole entire nerve is still intact, the likelihood of recovery there uh, is slim to none. And that would be somebody that would benefit from surgery. And obviously the patient doesn't come in with a label that says, you know, class four injury, but this is something that we need to work up and uh, figure out prior to making the treatment recommendation. So, 
here are some of the uh, nerve injury uh, types that, that we deal with. Some very common ones obviously include penetrating injury, things like a knife uh, that, that's employed in uh, injuring a nerve, or perhaps a piece of glass falling on somebody's arm. Um, and each one of these we treat differently and the timing is treated differently. So for example, if a knife is employed to injure a nerve and patient comes in with an obvious motor or sensory or both uh, deficit, then we uh, try to reapproximate those two nerve endings uh, that have been transected, usually within about three days. And we try to do that so that there's no tension on the nerve. And if we wait longer, the problem is the nerve will sort of retract. And if you try to reapproximate those two nerve endings under tension, uh, scar tissue is going to develop uh, between the two nerve endings and the nerve is never going to heal right and in fact may cause even bigger problems because that scar tissue in between those two, those two nerve endings um, is something called an aroma incontinuity and that can be painful uh, uh, to say the least. Lacerating injuries we treat differently so if a glass cut that same nerve we go ahead and we explore it and we debride it uh, make sure we try to take out uh, whatever whatever uh, devitalized tissue is there but all we do is we tack down the epineurium of the nerve so not the nerve itself but the the very surface of the nerve just tack it down to the local tissue so it does not retract and it holds there and then we come in several weeks later for the definitive repair. And the reason for that is because the lacerating injury from the glass is going to um, injure the nerve endings. It's not a clean cut. And so those nerve endings, if they're not healthy, if those fascicles are not healthy, reapproximating unhealthy nerve endings one to another is not gonna result in a good and lasting repair. Um, the more common type of ner nerve injury that we see is compression or stretch injury, where somebody, for example, um, you know, uh, gets uh, something that falls on their arm, but there's no penetration of the skin, and now they have a specific nerve injury. And that's a little more tricky because we don't really know whether that's a temporary injury or a permanent injury. If we knew up front, then we will go in and repair it if it, was, if it was something that needs to be repaired. So what we typically will do is we'll wait about three weeks. We'll ask our neurology colleagues to do an EMG or nerve conduction study. Uh, and that's gonna be our baseline. And then we watch that patient for about three to six months. We'd like to not wait more than about a year, uh, again, depending on the nerve and the muscle group, because by then, if the nerve isn't functioning for more than that, then the muscle is going to atrophy. And so even if you do a brilliant repair after that time point, th there's nothing to innervate. So we try to intervene sort of in this time window, three to six months, maybe nine months, um, because that, that's going to actually result in an improvement. If we operate too early, that may be unnecessary. So we're gonna get our baseline EMG at three weeks, and then periodically we're going to reevaluate the patient both clinically and electrophysiologically. And very often the EMG will pick up uh, nerve healing, so to speak, nerve repair, uh, spontaneous nerve repair, before we're able to detect that clinically. And so if that occurs, we sit tight and we wait. If there's no improvement at three to six months, then we probably need to go in and explore and repair the nerve. A gunshot wound is very similar to a blunt, blunt injury in terms of the way we repair it because we really don't know whether that bullet actually traversed a nerve. Uh, and if so, we still need to wait uh, because of the blast injury and the heat injury. We don't know what's healthy yet. Um, but it could also be that the blast injury itself without transecting the nerve had caused uh, injury to the nerve and that will spontaneously heal on occasion. So now I'm gonna give you a couple of brief examples. This is a penetrating stab injury in a young man uh, to the back of his arm. And so just as a brief anatomy review, these are uh, netter slides, of course, as you recognize, this is the back of the scapula. Um, here's the spine of the scapula. Um, and here you're gonna see the axillary nerve, for example, that comes out and innervates the deltoid muscle. And just you get, you get a peak or a glimpse uh, of the radial nerve in between the two heads of the triceps. So if we go ahead and we strip the, stri the triceps off in this image on the right, you see that the nerve, as I described earlier, the nerve is running all the way down, as you know, down to the hand. Um, but it gives off branches along the way. And in this case, it's giving off branches to the triceps musculature. And so this young man came in and he had a wrist drop and a finger drop, but he did not have any triceps weakness. And so this is an intraoperative photo and this little vessel loop is around the deep brachial artery. Um, and these, uh, the two nerve endings are right here. It's not a great shot, but the two instruments are holding the two nerve endings and you can see there's a bit of a gap. 
And unfortunately, despite dissecting proximally and distally, um, I was really unable to bring the two edges close enough together, even though I operated about 36 hours after this injury, bring the two edges together well enough without tension to be satisfied that there's going to be no neuroma that develops. Again, the top of the picture, I'm sorry, is, is proximal, so towards the shoulder. Down is towards the hand. This is medial, and to the right is lateral. And so here you see the two nerve endings with the gap in between. And so what I ended up doing here, and this repair is probably 10 or 15 years ago, I put in something called a neurotube, which is made out of polyglycolic acid, basically similar material to what, you use, what we use in dissolvable sutures. So this tube will dissolve, and you'll see very fine sutures, just a couple of them that are holding in the edges of the nerve. So the nerve is plugged into this tube. There's a gap in between, but now at least the nerve has a pathway uh, to try to heal and try to connect to the other end. And obviously you can't use this uh, for, for any length that you want, but up to two centimeters, um, there should be, um, the nerve should be able to find one another. And in fact, in this young man, it took about a year, uh, but his uh, wrist drop and his finger drop improved uh, dramatically. These days, uh, we're probably gonna use something a little bit different. And this is a nerve graft, uh, which is human decellularized and, and cleansed uh, extracellular matrix and essentially this is a, a scaffolding so that the axons can grow through this graft and reach to the other side. So we're essentially instead of using a tube we're going to take this nerve graft, uh, put a few stitches uh, to connect on one end, a few stitches on the other, um, and hopefully one end of the nerve will actually find the other. Switching gears a little bit, this is a gunshot wound and this is a young man as well who got shot in the back of the leg and on the right here you see you see the entry wound. Um, and ever since the gunshot, he immediately developed a foot drop. And this is now probably about nine months later when I was seeing him for the first time. Uh, so just as a brief anatomy review, this is the back of the leg. This is the gastrocnemius muscle, obviously. Uh, here's the tibial nerve coming down. So the, the sciatic nerve ends just above where this picture is. And you are going to then have a splitting of the sciatic nerve into the common perineal nerve, which I have my cursor on here and the posterior tibial nerve. These are the popliteal vessels. Um, and then these nerves obviously will give off branches. In this case, these are the branches of the sural nerve, which go all the way down to innervate the lateral aspect of the foot. Uh, but here's the common perineal nerve. And we know that this is a common perineal nerve injury because of the proximity of the gunshot wound to the fibular head right here, um, as well as the fact that he clinically has a complete foot drop. So what I drew out here is my incision to explore the perineal nerve, and also my incision for a sural nerve cable graft in case I would need it. And I just extended it with dotted lines along the course of the nerve in case I need to go that high, in case I need a segment that that's long. So again, to the right is, is the patient's head, to the left is his foot. Um, and once we did the opening, this is the, this is the uh, common perineal nerve coming down. This is the sural nerve branching off. Um, and what you see is a significant abnormality in the nerve uh, at approximately the level that I'm, that I'm circling. Um, and that's where the bullet probably either went through um, or at least the blast injury was close enough that there's significant enough blast injury. And what you see is essentially scar in the nerve and that's why it's not functioning well. Uh, and that's an aroma in continuity. So proximal to that, you have normal appearing nerve and distal to that, you have normal appearing nerve, but in between, um, obviously that nerve is extremely abnormal. So what we did here was we tested to see if there's any conduction across from this probe to this probe. If there's no conduction that I can simply excise this neuroma in continuity and put in a couple of grafts to connect them because we don't have a single graft that's this diameter that's this large, it's a fairly large nerve. And so that's pretty straightforward. The problem in this case was that there was some continuity. So when we stimulated this white three-pronged electrode and recorded with this black uh, two-pronged electrode, there was some conduction across. So there was something working here. Um, so what I ended up doing was excising the neuroma itself. And when we got down to healthy uh, appearing nerve, we stopped and I re-stimulated and there was still the same conduction across telling me that this was in fact the nerve, uh, the portion of the nerve that was still functional. But obviously now we have a much smaller diameter nerve and can conduct a lot less information. Um, and that's still going to leave him with a significant uh, foot drop. 
And so we then went down to the ankle where the sural nerve was. And so the vessel loop here is around the lesser saphenous vein, uh, the greater saphenous vein being on the other side of the, of the ankle. And that's what uh, cardiac surgeons will commonly use for, for uh, a bypass operation. Uh, but here we see the nerve and I know how long of a segment I need. And I can go ahead and excise this, uh, even though I know that this will result in a sensory deficit to the foot. And we warned the patient in advance, you're going to have some loss of sensation if we need a graft. You're going to have some loss of sensation in the outer aspect of the foot. But hopefully the goal will be that now at least you'll be able to uh, dorsiflex your foot and you won't have a drop foot. So that's what we did. And just with a few sutures, sutured in a cable graft. Again, this is the original part of the nerve. And this is the cable graph. You have it on one side, you have it on the other. And in fact, this also took probably about 18 months. And he wasn't full strength when we were, when we were done at the last follow-up, but he was about a four minus out of five, which is actually not only quite functional, uh, but was able to get him out of his uh, brace, out of his ankle foot orthosis. Now, part of peripheral nerve, of course, involves uh, peripheral nerve tumors. Uh, in fact, peripheral nerve tumors can exist anywhere in the body. Um, and they start with the spine because you have the dorsal and the ventral nerve rootlets as they come out and form the mixed nerve. This is the dorsal root ganglion. So tumors can occur anywhere along this path all the way out into the periphery. So here's a brief example of a right L5 schwannoma. And so this is intradural and you have this enhancing almost dumbbell shaped mass trying to exit the neural foramen. Uh, you see that it's filling up the majority of the spinal canal. Um, and this is a benign intradural schwannoma. Here's another example of a schwannoma. This one is a little different. And this one happens to be in the pelvis. So on the left side, this, by the way, is the front. This is the back, right side, left side. On the left side, you have the iliacus muscle right up against the ilium. You have the psoas muscle. And in between, you have some bowel loops. On the right side, though, the bowel loops are probably pushed forward. And what you have instead is this oval shaped mass, very well circumscribed, uh, that was found to be a schwannoma. In fact, a schwannoma of the femoral nerve. Uh, and so we went ahead and uh, excised that. And here's an MRI from four years later. Um, and this is bowel loop, but the tumor was right in between the iliacus muscle and the psoas muscle right here. Uh, here's yet one more example of a right femoral nerve schwannoma. So this is the front. This is the back, uh, obviously, of the leg. Uh, this is the femur. Uh, you can see on axial imaging, here's the femur as well. Here's a very well circumscribed enhancing mass right next to the blood vessels, namely the femoral nerve, uh, excuse me, the femoral artery and femoral vein. Um, and there's a tumor right where the nerve is supposed to be, very well circumscribed. And that's a femoral nerve schwannoma. Uh, and this is now eight years later in the two panels on the right.